Uh, sure. Thank you, Professor Tukovic. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, I think, for you here. Um, Iago Oliveira, I'm talking from uh, Brazil. And this work was also executed by, authored by my supervisor, Professor Gash, from UNESP in Sao Paulo, by medical doctor Carlos Bassin, and also by Professor Cardi from UCB. So let me introduce you to uh, intracranial aneurysms. Uh, Aneurysms in general, they are uh, pathological dilatations of the arteries that, of the human vascular system. And intracranial aneurysms, particularly, they normally occur in the arteries that reach the brain in a region called uh, the circle of Reeves, as you can see in this picture here. Okay. Uh, the most common form occur in, um, in a saccular shape. Uh, normally in the bifurcations of the of the arteries, but they may also occur laterally, as you can see here. Uh, a typical example is shown in this picture of a medium-sized aneurysm with seven millimeters. And just for the sake of comparison, uh, the arteries in the brain, they have um, around two to four millimeters in diameter. And the aneurysms, they can grow as high as large as uh, 25 millimeters. So what's the problem with them? The main problem with them is that they may rupture. And if they rupture, they cause a fatal event sometimes for the patient called subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, and although the rupture rate per year is relatively small, the, uh, the mortality rate of the disease is pretty high with uh, mortality of up to 60%, with 30% of morbidity in, uh, among the patients that survive. And additionally, it is also a pretty prevalent uh, disease in the world's population, with some estimates showing that this number may reach up to 5%, which is around 200 million people, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so treatments today, they exist, but uh, the treatments, they also pose risks. And physicians today, they mainly base their decision to treat or not on the clinical history of the patient, but also on the size of the enemies. And the problem is that, um, for medium-sized aneurysms from 7 to 13 millimeters approximately, the rupture risk is approximately the same that the risk of complications after the surgical procedure. So when they face uh, a small aneurysm, they may they have a tough decision ahead of them. So what researchers have been looking for in the past two decades are better metrics to help the physician in these decisions. Uh, so one way they have been looking for that, uh, this matter metric, is through hemodynamics, uh, because hemodynamic is behind the inception and the growth of aneurysms. Um, but to compute hemodynamics in these small arteries is kind of complicated, so they turned to computational fluid dynamics to do that. As you can see in this plot showing the number of publications involving intracranial aneurysms and computational fluid dynamics over the three past decades. You see that the number of works started to increase uh, substantially at the beginning of the millennium and continue to, to increase. Uh, but those works, they weren't concerned particularly with the wall mechanics of the aneurysms because that's important because uh, ultimately, although the hemodynamics what drives the aneurysm to a state that may rupture or not, uh, the rupture occurs in the wall and from a theoretical perspective, it will occur when the stress is exceed the strength limit of the wall tissue. Uh, so that would be a better metric, for example, to predict the rupture of a particular aneurysm. But those studies particularly, they assumed the wall to be rigid, so they didn't investigate the wall mechanics at all. And the number of works that actually simulated the wall motion and stress is either via computational solid dynamics or fluid solid interaction techniques are comparatively in a small number. And those works, they were also, they had their flaws too, because uh, they either used very simplifying hypotheses or they didn't investigate the wall mechanics at all. They were more concerned about the hemodynamics too. Um, and the very simplifying hypothesis is kind of understandable because uh, at the time there weren't too much information about the constitutive behavior of the wall of intracranial aneurysms. But that is starting to change. For example, in the past decade, there were some experimental works that um, uh, plotted the uh, stress stretch curves for intracranial aneurysm specifically, as you can see in the results of the work by Robertson in 2015. 
uh, and compared with the stress strain curve of intracranial arteries. So we see that aneurysms, they are uh, weaker as expected. And, uh, but from these plots, we can have the material constants of intracranial aneurysm tissue, allowing us to have a more realistic model for the wall motion, uh, then allowing to simulate the wall. But there are some other features about uh, soft tissues that are uh, important to, to, us to consider, such as incompressibility, for example. Um, uh, incompressibility is commonly is a common feature for all soft tissues and especially arteries. And uh, when thinking about simulating the motion of incompressible tissues, um, challenges ex exist using the displacement-based segregated algorithms that are most commonly available today, especially due to volumetric locking, which causes unrealistic small displacement and the deterioration of the convergence as the Poisson ratio tends to the 0.5. Uh, purely incompressible limit, okay? So in this scenario, and think that we wanted to uh, simulate the wall motion of a real intracranial aneurysms, um, the main goal of this work was to uh, use numerical techniques to assess what would be the effect of the tissue compressibility using a nearly compressible um, modeling on the, on the stresses and strains of intracranial aneurysms walls, okay? So let me go through a little bit of the methodology we employed. So first we have to simulate a fluid, rigorously a fluid solid interaction problem um, where the main driving force of the wall motion, as you can see in this uh, schematic picture of an aneurysm is the blood flow. And the blood was assumed a weakly compressible Newtonian fluid. So a barotropic equation of state was solved together with the continuity equation and the uh, momentum equation, where the Cauchy stress takes the form of the Newtonian uh, rheological behavior. Regarding the boundary conditions, uh, when we extract the geometries of intracranial aneurysms from medical images, we have to cut the branch, the arterial branches at some specified location, and then there we impose the boundary conditions, which in this particular case, um, we're assuming to be a steady state. So I impose the inlet velocity calculated from a blood flow rate at the peak systole conditions, okay? So at the harshest conditions of the heart, of the cardiac cycle. Um, we didn't simulate the whole cardiac cycle because we assumed that the temporality of the problem wouldn't be uh, important concerning the compressibility. Um, so we just wanted the effect on the wall mechanics specifically. So correspondingly at the outlets, uh, apart from the typical CFD conditions, uh, we also impose the peak systolic pressure value, okay, which is around 120 millimeters mercury. And on the inner surface corresponding to the fluid soil interaction surface, because the problem was assumed as a steady state, uh, we used instead of the two-way full coupled FSI strategy, only a one-way FSI strategy in which the blood flow forces they were calculated and then interpolated to the inner surface of the wall, okay? But the displacement was not interpolated back to have the effect that on the flow domain. Um, so what about the wall, uh, the wall tissue modeling? Well, since it is a steady state problem, we solve the momentum equation, uh, in this case, assuming finite deformation regime. So uh, in the total Lagrangian formulation, as you can see here, taking the form of, a, of an equilibrium equation, where the Cauchy stress, the sigma S, uh, was calculated by using different hyperelastic laws, which are commonly employed for soft tissues such as arteries. Um, and the general constitutive equation for the Cauchy stress took this form, uh, this huge uh, thing here. And uh, it has two portions. So the volumetric portion uh, is where the compressibility effect effectively enters. I'm going to show you in a minute how we model it. And the second portion of the equation is the deviatoric one that depends on the deformation too, uh, through the V, the V deformation tensor, and also on the particular form of the strain energy function of the hyperelastic laws employed. Okay. For the boundary conditions, apart from the inner surface where the blood flow forces were imposed, on the outer surface of the wall, we imposed a uniform intracranial pressure, uh, 
And at the artificial sections created, uh, we imposed a zero displacement boundary condition. Okay. So let's see the uh, strain energy functions that we employed because we wanted to test the different ones. Which was fast is the effect of compressibility would be different. Uh, we use the three parameter Mooney Rivlin law. Uh, you can see on the right the, uh, the constitutive equation for a new axial problem, okay, using material constants of intracranial aneurysms. Uh, the Yeol law, and also a, an isotropic version of the fund law used for other soft tissues. We use these three because they were used in previous. Uh, numerical studies with intracranial aneurysms. And additionally, they were also used to fit the experimental data of the works that I show you um, in the introduction with intracranial aneurysm mechanical tests, okay? So we had the values of the material constants uh, for intracranial aneurysm tissue specifically. And regarding the volumetric modeling, so the volumetric modeling uh, concerns about the hydrostatic pressure. It was modeled using an early compressible approach where the hydrostatic pressure depend on the bulk modulus and the deformation, uh, the Jacobian of the deformation gradient. And for numerical reasons, um, instead of explicitly including this equation in the, the Cauchy stress, we added uh, two terms, two numerical terms of a Laplacian in two in an implicit and an explicit way to add. Um, uh, stabilization to the pressure field because it is known that in segregated algorithms uh, it may appear oscillations in the pressure field okay uh, but there's these two terms uh, mathematically they cancel out at convergence this is the so-called Richard correction it features in other solvers of solids for foam two and gamma is the pressure diffusivity that depended on the on the material properties and also on the coefficients of the matrix and most importantly, the bulk modulus was modeled using the linearizer theory and depended on the specific value of the Poisson ratio. And to assess the effect of compressibility, we changed the Poisson ratio from 0 0.45 to 0 0.49, okay, incrementally by 0 0.01. So the results that I'm gonna show you uh, at the end, um, the comparison was performed between these values of the Poisson ratio, okay? Finally, before, before going to the results, let me just go over quickly uh, some numerical strategies employed. Uh, so to extract the geometries, we use the vascular modeling toolkit, which uh, specializes in um, extracting surface models from medical images. From the surface model, we built the fluid mesh with CF mesh, and uh, the solid wall was created with the MTK2 by extruding it uh, outwards using a thickness field that was computed by a particular wall model that accounts the heterogeneity uh, in thickness and material properties of aneurysms walls. Because we know that, as you can see in these two examples of real aneurysms, um, the wall of the aneurysms, they are heterogeneous. As you can see, there are patches that are more red, and they are more red because you can see the blood on the other side, so the wall is thinner. Uh, but there are also um, these whitish, this whitish or yellowish patches, which indicates atherosclerosis, and there the wall is thicker and also stiffer, okay? And we know that that is caused by the underlying hemodynamics inside the aneurysm. So based on the model, the surface model, as you can see here, we ran the CFD, so the numerical simulation for the flow inside the aneurysm, and based on the wall shear stress particularly, and other hemodynamic parameters, we estimated the patches that were thicker, as you can see in this first picture that shows the aneurysm thickness, EW, um, but also the patches that were stiffer uh, on the aneurysm wall, as you can see here with the C10 coefficient of the Mooney Rivlin law. Okay, uh, well, I won't go over all the details about that because it would take some time, but if you are uh, if you need some time to use that, just let me know and I can explain it better. Um, so before I go into the results, I just want to go over the numerical framework, which was solids for foam. Uh, this is a diagram of the um, classes structure in solids for foam, which eventually you may have seen in uh, some other places and also in uh, the talk by Professor Cardiff yesterday. Um, 
So there is the fluid models, the fluid coupling models, and also the solid models. And inside the solid models and in the mechanical laws, all those models, they were implemented uh, through what I call the biomechanical law class because it features uh, particular characteristics of biological tissues um, behavior, such as pre-stress, which although it wasn't used in this work particularly, is important to account for other studies. The heterogeneity of the material constants that I showed you previously, the volumetric stress particularly, and from these biomechanical laws, uh, it derives the three uh, laws that were used in this work. So the moon rivling one, the Yale law, and the uh, isotropic fund model, okay? So let's go over some of the results. Um, uh, we analyzed mainly two variables, two physical variables, so the stress and the stretch. And for the stress, uh, we extracted the largest principal value of the Cauchy stress tensor because normal components of the stress are more important for soft tissues to assess um, the likelihood of rupture or not. And for the stretch, we extracted the largest principal value of the stretch tensor particularly. So we can see the stress on the top for the different Poisson ratios. Um, and also here only for the Yeola, but uh, we found similar, similar behavior for the other laws too. So we see that there's not too much difference between the patterns of uh, stress and stretch as we increased the Poisson ratio. Only if you inspect closely, we can see that some portions, for example, here in the stretch, uh, it tends to be higher with the smallest value of the Poisson ratio. And uh, to assess that more quantitatively, we uh, computed two metrics of the stress and stretch over the aneurysm surface only, corresponding to the luminal surface, so the inner surface of the, of the wall. And uh, you can see here the surface average uh, of the stress and also the 99th percentile of the distribution because we didn't want to use the absolute maximum because it may be, uh, even, uh, even though we, we performed uh, mesh tests independence, mesh sensitivity tests, uh, the absolute max may be influenced by, by the mesh. Um, so we see that the surface average, it, it changes not that much uh, um, depending on the hyperelastic law and the behaviors tends to change. So for the L law, the surface average tends to increase for the stress and for the fund law, it tends to decrease, okay? But the relative difference, the maximum relative difference between the 0 0.45 and the 0 0.49 has a maximum for the EO law and the 99 percentile with 6%, which is relatively small if we compared, for example, other, uh, if we performed other comparisons, for example, with different material laws, okay? Because you can see that the, uh, the levels of stress tend to change by changing the hyperelastic loss, okay? And the average uh, difference was only 2%. A similar uh, finding was, uh, was found for the stretch, but the, consist the behavior was more consistent. So as we increase the Poisson ratio, both the surface average and the max, the 99th percentile of the stretch tend to decrease by a smaller amount with a maximum relative difference, 2% recorded for the 99th percentile of the EO law, which is also small compared to other parametric analysis that we perform, for example, by comparing the particular hyperelastic laws. Okay, so those values they could guide, uh, and it actually guided me in a larger study uh, of intracranial aneurysms to select which Poisson ratio would be best to be used in other studies, especially because. The convergence behavior was pretty much pretty different between the three hyperelastic laws um, as we increase the Poisson ratio, as you can see here. So uh, with the normalized residuals uh, for different Poisson ratio. So the, the shades of gray, as you uh, the, the blue gets darker, it means the increasing of the Poisson ratio. So we can see that the all law, even for the 0 0.9, 0 0.49 Poisson ratio it gets reasonably fast results, although there's a lot of uh, iterations in this case, but I assure you that for this kind of simulation, that is fast. Uh, compared to the moon rivling and the fund law that uh, for the 0 0.49, it gets too many iterations to converge, okay? Which impacted, for example, in the pulsatile simulations that we performed too. Um, so finally, some conclusions. Uh, so 
by the qualitative comparison, the patterns of stress and stretch, uh, they were pretty much similar, um, which impacted in the quantitative comparison where the stretch tends to decrease overall as the Poisson ratio increased. And the stress, uh, it had a different behavior according to the hyperelastic law, but approximately it remained constant for some laws and potentially increased for others. And finally, that could help us uh, to guide, uh, for example, the decision of which hyperelastic law to choose, because that's something that we don't know either when simulating intracranial aneurysms and arteries. Uh, because, for example, based on the residual behavior, the YAW law was the fastest one, and the results were not very different uh, compared to the other laws. So it could be used, for example, in larger studies that would be more important for the medical community, uh, where we simulate, would simulate um, uh, other geometries of aneurysms too. Okay. So uh, that was all for my presentation. Thanks for the attention and I'm open for any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Iago. Can you hear me, Iago? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I, I think uh, there are... I, think, I will yeah. ask now audience if uh, they have a question and I will pass sure. the mic to some... Hi, yeah, good. Uh, that was Hi. a nice presentation. Uh, this Thank is Emad. Uh, I, I wanted to ask a question about the boundary condition at the fluid side and uh, yeah. at the outlet of the fluid side. So mm -hmm. since your fluid, you have modeled the fluid using weakly compressible model. So did you have yeah. any problem for boundary condition of the pressure at the outlet? No, not in this study. This study was a, simp was a simpler one where uh, only the, the steady state modeling was used. But even for the, I also ran some PUSA tie simulations for the whole cardiac cycle, but I didn't have any problem with the pressure boundary conditions. I used in, though, in the other simulations of the whole cardiac cycle, I imposed a resistance boundary conditions where the pressure changes over time too. And uh, it didn't appear to any problems in this, at least by looking at the solution at the fields of wall shear stress and also from the, uh, the wall stress solution. No, not that, I'm, not that I remember at least. So in more detail, I mean, what was the, pre what was the pressure condition at the inlet and outlet? So this is my, can you read? Yeah, at the inlet, I imposed the velocity one and the zero gradient uh, pressure boundary condition. And at the outlets, the pressure was specified, but the velocity gradient was set to zero. It was a typical uh, CFD combination of inlet and outlet pressure boundary conditions in the simulations. Yes, for incompressible, that works. But for compressible, you might have some wave re reflection. So oh, okay, yes, yeah, uh, yeah. yes. And In this fluid. case, I employed the I employed the advective one for the pulsatile simulation, that ones that leaves the uh, the waves to continue. Yeah, I mean what you what you you are asking now. Okay, okay. So in in foam extend, there is one called advective one. It was done. It was the boundary condition that I use at least for the uh, pulsatile simulations. But that for my simulations didn't affect because I use the one-way FSI strategy. If I use the two-way FSI strategy, which I ran for some cases, um, even with the advective boundary condition, I didn't get the results to convert for the whole cardiac cycle. But uh, at least when I was doing that, uh, I noticed that it helped with the problem of the back propagation, let's say, of the waves at the outlets. OK, thank you. OK. Thank you very much. Do we have uh, further questions? No? I have one question. Uh, why uh, why uh, you use compressible liquid model? Oh, yeah. That was also because um, when I started to perform the simulations, I was trying to do that with uh, a full two-way FSI strategy. And according to some reports, uh, the weakly compressible fluid could help in stabilizing the solution. So that was more like a, um, a model that was a leftover from those simulations. You know, I then decided to continue to use, uh, based on some early experimental works that uh, actually measure the compressibility of blood. 
So that was just for uh, um, a consequence of the other simulations that I was doing with the two-way FSI strategy. Okay, so you use this to stabilize FSI simulation. Yes, exactly. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Rita Pereira. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Ming. Uh, today, I will present our work, named a computational methodology to predict the effect of different classifier models. Uh, this work was developed during my master thesis with supervision of Professor Miguel Nobrega uh, of the University of Ming and Professor Anna Norton uh, of the Univers University of Porto uh, from Portugal. Um, and with special support with the MAPA company uh, on market, market leader uh, in the in pacifier. Uh, I start uh, my presentation with uh, the introduction, the state of art, motivation of uh, our work, um, what uh, are specifications the, the computational model developed, methodology, computational models um, that was developed, classifier assessment, results, discussion, and uh, conclusions, and finally future work. Um, this work was focused uh, on pacifier second habits. Based on literature, the prevalence of the, the use uh, of pacifier is up to 42.5% by the age of 12 months. Um, during the section, uh, the pacifier, so sorry, the tongs push the pacifier against the pallets. Uh, and in the final movement, um, the intraoral pressure, uh, negative, uh, intraoral negative pressure, uh, is generated within inoral cavity, with its peak. Um, when tongue, tongues starts um, to return uh, the initial position. Uh, over the years, several studies uh, have been conducted in attempt to understand the relationship um, the section pacifier and development of malocclusions. So these studies um, prove that uh, are, um, there are must um, increase the, the pacifier seconds are must increase the overjet and overbite. Uh, research in the computational area um, allow use to, to verify that uh, uh, there are only two uh, studies um, that analyze the mechanical behavior of uh, pacifier in contact with, um, with orofacial structures. The first study, um, the aim of, uh, of this study uh, is assessed the, the, was assessed the, the stress conditions asserted during the section cycle by three different pacifiers. As you can see here, the orthodontic pacifier, conventional pacifier, and physiological pacifier. So the research concludes that different results um, that we um, they have um, they have different results of stress distribution. So different pacifiers promotes different uh, stress distributions on the pallet, uh, and and the uh, orthodontic pacifier promotes a more healthy. Uh, development of orofacial structures. Uh, in another study, uh, the, the study demonstrates that uh, computational finite element models can be used to relieve simulation dynamic interaction uh, between a pacifier, the pallet, and the tongue. Uh, the research concludes that um, a, a nonlinear transient dynamic finite element model can simulate the mechanical behavior of a pacifier and its interaction. And quantitative results uh, can be used in uh, comparative studies to, to provide insights on how pacifiers uh, promote change, uh, change in, the, um, in, the, in the dental tissues and facial uh, de development. So um, the main ob object of the, this, uh, this work uh, is development of a computational methodology capable of predicting the behavior of babies or of self structures during suction. Uh, initially, the, the focus and uh, the motivation of this work is in the fact that epidemiological studies 
are based on clinical observation so uh, and empirical knowledge so are not consensual um, and uh, another way uh, the computational studies um, present quite simplified models so the polite uh, was considered um, as a, a homogeneous model uh, it's not correspond uh, to, to the reality uh, and consider static configurations as i said before um, the section cycle is a dynamic uh, dynamic cycle so uh, in these studies the um, the section uh, cycle is considered irrelevant and uh, yet the error of simplifications not be uh, quantified and uh, it's most probability that um, uh, that the the conclusions and the results of these works uh, are not fully representative of the reality so um, we believe that the a more complex um, computational model and a more real, realistic uh, computational model um, we have uh, here an opportunity to to compare different designs um, of uh, of the pacifiers uh, and uh, obtain additional information uh, about the, the effect of different designs in the pacifiers and uh, to obtain guidelines um, in order to ob uh, obtain guidelines to uh, to develop uh, uh, a new designs of pacifiers. So, uh, as I said before, um, the the pallet has has confused a different with different tissues. So, uh, a research in the uh, proved this. So, uh, the pallet uh, is uh, confused uh, um, the, with the mucosa, cortical bone, cancellous bone alveolar bone, periodontal ligament, so uh, different tissues with different mechanical properties. And in terms of the tooth, the tooth the development, um, the tooth development is uh, the evol evolutive, um, evolutive uh, process, so um, it, uh, it was necessary uh, to specific the phase of the development, so uh, we select the six months old and in this um, in this uh, uh, this computational model, um, we consider uh, the tooth erup eruption, tooth development, tooth position, and tooth dimensions. In terms of the the tongue, uh, it uh, it was necessary to consider um, the structure, the dimensions, the muscle regions, as you can see here with different uh, different colors and uh, the uh, friction uh, coefficient between the tongue and pacifier and finally uh, the suction cycle is a dynamic so uh, it is important to consider uh, suction phase time max tongue displacement and internal negative pressure um, generated within the, the oral cavity so the, our computational model uh, was uh, is confused um, by with uh, a pallet. Uh, the the pallet um, was obtained by digitalizing a plaster model uh, of six uh, six months uh, old baby. Um, uh, and uh, in this study. Uh, we consider the two different pacifiers, so orthodontic pacifier and conventional pacifier. The orthodontic pacifier uh, was provided and the conventional pacifier was modeling in a 3D modeling software, so uh, Blender. Uh, and uh, the tongue uh, is, uh, was properly uh, dimensioned and, um, and defined the regions of, of the muscles. Uh, and, uh, is is model uh, was modeling it is was modeling in um, in a blender uh, and finally in terms of dental crowns um, we consider six different uh, dental crowns and model um, in a, in a blender with a specific dimensions 
uh, for for the the study uh, for the um, the specific phase of development of this study. Um, after being the um, the model, uh, it uh, it is necessary to uh, delimit the um, the the surface uh, in order to uh, assign the, the bonding conditions. Uh, so um, we consider the suction phase time, a max tongue displacement, a friction coefficient between the, the tongue and the and pacifier, and internal negative pressure um, generated within uh, the oral cave. Uh, in terms of the methodology, uh, CF mesh tool um, was used to, to mesh generation. Uh, in house utility that collects points, face, and cells uh, in sets, and open form utility to convert the sets in, uh, in zones. And uh, uh, final assignments the, the material properties to the different cell zones uh, with, uh, with data taken from the literature are present in this table. So um, in this work, it, it was possible to uh, develop uh, four uh, different uh, models. So model 1T, 3T, 4T, and 5T. Uh, these models differ, um, differ in terms of the palate tissue, so number of palate tissue. Um, as you can see in this video, um, the different tissues uh, in observe. Okay, alveolar bone, uh, now cancellous bone. Cortical bone and mucus and okay. So there are two different uh, computational models of different pacifiers. Uh, here we see, you can see the orthodontic pacifier and the conventional pacifier. Uh, it should be noted uh, that the orthodontic pacifier doesn't adapt the, the palate. So it, uh, it was necessary to apply the initial displacement uh, in the, the tongue uh, in order to um, the suction cycle uh, initiate uh, uh, the, the tongue uh, initiate in the same position uh, than the, the, the orthodontic pacifier. So with the, the computational model developed, uh, it was possible to uh, compare different pacifiers, different designs of pacifiers. Uh, based on stress um, distribution of stress on the palate surface, uh, force asserted uh, for that pacifier asserted on the, the palate surface, and the tooth displacement. So, in terms of uh, this, uh, distribution of stress on the palate, as you can see here. Um, the different uh, pacifiers promote different um, stress distribution on the palate. Um, it should be noted the difference between model one, uh, one T and five T. Um, so it uh, it's a reinforced importance um, that is important to consider different issues on the palate. So to to more concrete results and uh, current results. Um, so the conventional pacifier promotes higher values uh, in um, in palate, so uh, higher probability um, uh, probability to, to promote um, development of um, of small occlusions. So in terms of the first asher to the the palate, um, the conventional pacifier um, represented um, in uh, in red line. Um, uh, uh, obtained the, the higher values uh, when compared to the orthodontic pacifier. So, okay. Um, as uh, I can see, it, uh, I, I said before, um, 
it uh, it was possible compare different pacifiers uh, based on tooth displacement. Here you can see the orthodontic uh, computational model, uh, and uh, uh, here the, um, the original displacement, and here uh, uh, we can see the, um, the displacement uh, on hundred uh, times higher. Um, in order to better the, um, the effects of the pacifiers um, on the tooth. Um, you can see here the, the, um, the displacement of, uh, uh, of, pacifi of uh, tooth during the suction cycle. Uh, we have difference between uh, orthodontic pacifier and conventional pacifier. So conventional pacifier promotes the largest, the largest tooth displacement. Um, and uh, model 5D uh, is a, a more realistic uh, uh, computational model uh, developed. Uh, here, there are um, the results uh, the, of model 1T and 5T, and um, uh, you can, um, can compare um, the difference between orthodontic and conventional pacifier um, uh, that promotes a largest tooth displacement um, in the, the, dent, uh, the, the teeth um, with special uh, incidence on central incisor. So as you can see in this graph. Okay. So, uh, there are a uh, comparison between the, um, the different models, the palate uh, models. Um, there are uh, significant difference between model 1T and 5T, um, but uh, between model uh, 3T and 4T and 5T, uh, there are no significant difference. So uh, for this, the, um, the results uh, of model 3T and 4T uh, will not be present uh, here. So, um, okay. so the results uh, allow you to conclude that um, uh, conventional pacifier promotes uh, uh, largest um, values on, uh, on the stress distributions and the pellets. Um, the, the pacifier, uh, the conventional pacifier promotes um, higher force asserted on the, the pellet surface when compared to the orthodontic pacifier. And the conventional pacifier promotes the largest tooth displacement. Um, and, uh, with the, um, and with prevalence of uh, the malocclusions, uh, class one and class two, and finally, uh, the orthodontic pacifier is preferable uh, when uh, compared with the, the conventional pacifier. So we, we can conclude that uh, the computational methodology proved to be efficient uh, in predict the behavior of orofacial structures uh, during pacifier sucking. Uh, that it is important uh, to consider different uh, tissues on the palate to so in order to to, to analyze a more realistic um, a more realistic computational model um, and consider the suction cycle and different mechanical properties um, and finally the results obtained allow concluding that com uh, conventional pacifier triggers a significant increase in anterior open bite, posterior open bite, class one uh, malocclusions with projection of central incisors and class two uh, malocclusions uh, when compared with orthodontic pacifier. Uh, in terms of the uh, future work and ongoing work uh, on my PhD, um, I believe that a more uh, realistic orofacial structures 3D model is it is important to uh, more accurate results. Uh, a more accurate constitutive model. So in this work, 
uh, we we consider a linear elastic model so you can see the a more um, realistic uh, constitutive law um, modeling of the tongue muscles the, the tongue is most complex so most complex so for this um, it is important uh, work uh, on this um, employed more results suction conditions so in terms of uh, the suction pattern so um, suction phase and movement of the tongue the first shirt the tongue uh, first that tongue is shared on the pacifier and so on and um, perform calculation in a reasonable uh, calculation time and uh, we believe that a more realistic computational model will allow to obtain concrete concrete data uh, on the effect of pacifier and open the um, to the road digital transformation uh, of the the pacifier so thank you for so thank you thank you for for your attention the there there is a nod so thank you so much Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, when you get back two slides and where you showed your conclusions, no, I think one one more where the fifth conclusion. So I, I don't get why where you where you know how you have this malocclusions, malocclusions it's called. Um, from um, from the conventional pacifiers um, compared to um, to the new one because I mean you got like stress data or you have like forces but how you can map it to to the behavior or to um, to the effect the, the concrete effect because I have um, kind of same problem and biologists always kill me when I tell them um, that this would be like that getting stress and then to say that would be like this you understand my question <laughs> <laughs> so so how can you claim that how can you claim that you you have these malocclusions because you have like forces and stress and you can see that the stress is higher but how can you claim that did, that this would lead to a malocclusion or not so is there a kind of a dose response study or anything how you how you can define that is, is how you translate it you understand So you can actually help. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, maybe it is not clear understanding your the aim or your question. One of the results you saw is the two uh, deep displacement. So we are relating that uh, as a cycle displacement with the formation of malocclusion, with the tendency for malocclusion. And uh, okay, so this is this is our the correlation uh, that is being made. Uh, it's not just uh, the stress uh, distribution or, or the pressure on the plate. We're modeling into the detail and to the, 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 the teeth tissue, okay? Mm -hmm. And there is one important detail, Rita. We deleted a few slides due to the time and there were no references to solids for foam in the, in the presentation. Uh, and uh, but we, do not use solids for foam. we use solids for foam. <laughs> it's it uh, it was clear from we use it. We didn't change anything in solids for foam. Okay, do we have additional questions from audience? Uh, maybe you could explain to me about the, the can maybe could you explain something about the setup and the software. Yeah, okay, yes. Uh.
Okay. Uh, it's a contact between the, the pacifier with the, the, the pallet. So the top of the pacifier and the uh, here uh, of the pallet and contact with, with those. Okay, here, the, um, the white surface, okay, contact uh, with the bottom surface, okay, of the pacifier and um, top of the pacifier contact with the white surface of the palette. Okay, thank you. I saw one additional question. Somebody wanted to ask. No? Ah, you, you have. Yeah, thank you for a very nice uh, talk, very nice uh, animations and, and models. I, I was just wondering about the boundary condition for the tongue. You, did you say about how, how do you prescribe that? So, uh, in the, on the, the surface, so the white surface, uh, improve the contact with uh, with pacifier. Uh, here uh, we uh, we impose the um, displacement, so the max displacement um, of uh, four millimeters, and e uh, here the the zero shear. Okay, and this fix. Okay, a yellow uh, is a boundary condition fix. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have? Still questions? No, I would like to ask the online participant to unmute the mic and, and ask questions if necessary. Do we have questions from online participants? No? In that case, we can con conclude this presentation and we can uh, go to the next one. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Philip. Cardiff and I'm an associate professor in the School of Mechanical and Materials Engineering. So I'm going to talk about some uh, recent experiences I have implementing a vertex-centered final volume uh, method in open foam uh, for, for solid mechanics. Okay, so to begin with, I'm just going <coughs> to briefly review um, well, kind of the final volume method with an emphasis on Lagrangian uh, formulations. So two key ingredients when you're formulating a final volume method is the grid layout and a solution algorithm. So by grid layout, I mean, where are you storing your primary variables, your primary unknowns, whether it's velocity pressure or displacement. And so you can have cell-centered or vertex-centered are the most popular ones, but you can have face-centered and staggered grids, et cetera, et cetera. The solution algorithms, you broadly break them down into implicit and explicit, whether you have to solve a matrix or whether you don't, and you have current number conditions. Um, considerations, but also in implicit, you can break it down into segregated versus uh, block coupled versus some hybrid combination of these things. I think I will try and move this thing to the top. I don't know if I can get rid of this without going into the settings. Um, okay, so uh, if we take uh, Lagrangian solid mechanics, uh, I'm, this is my conservation linear momentum. Um, it's basically, uh, new to, let me see, sorry, with this. Okay, we're okay. Um, so on the left-hand side, we have mass by acceleration and then some of the forces on the right-hand side. So the idea of the final volume method or numerical methods like that is you apply that to some uh, integration volume. So that's the shaded green area. So we're gonna try and force that in some discrete manner on that shaded area. And we do that by writing this equation in terms of the displacements, our velocities and pressures at particular points. So unknown to particular points. And we call that a computational stencil or a computational molecule. So we have two, two concepts here. One is where we're enforcing it and one where we write it in terms of these discrete variables. So that's cell-centered, typical in open foam. Uh, there's a few flavors of vertex-centered. The most common flavor is you construct this dual mesh. So around each vertex in your primary mesh, you construct a control volume and that's your integration volume where you're enforcing that equation. Um, and then you do that in terms of the unknowns at the vertices. So the, your stencil is a little bit different um, and so is your integration area. And for comparison, the finite element method, it enforces the equation over all adjacent, adjacent elements around a node. So it's, it doesn't construct a dual uh, mesh, it can, uh, enforces over all of them, but the stencil is actually the same as the vertex center. The integration volume is different, but the stencil is the same. Um, 
One consequence of that, it's very weak, you can't really see it here, but the neighboring integration volumes do not overlap typically in finite volume, whereas they do overlap in uh, finite damage. That has some consequences for conservation locally. Um, also in finite damage, you will integrate the divergence terms as volume terms, whereas in finite volume, you do it over the surface. So that also, that's a consequence for local conservation. If we just look at the boundary uh, and we compare cell-centered and vertex-centered, one convenient feature of vertex-centered, I would say, is that you have unknowns directly on the boundary, where cell-centered you don't. Um, or at least you don't typically, you can add them, but then you have to extend your linear system and it becomes a bit of a pain, but you, you, can, you can do that. That's important for traction boundary conditions in, in uh, solid mechanics, because they're kind of complicated. If you want some bedtime reading, I, I often put this up, uh, I put it up yesterday. So Demirjic and, and I, I wrote a, a long paper with 600 references uh, reviewing the last 30 years of, in this broad area, if, you, if you're interested. Okay, so to talk about what is new. Uh, so a new generalized approach. Uh, this is more of an ambition rather than what is actually done. So uh, I, what do I mean by general? So general in terms of grid arrangement to derive an approach that could be implemented as vertex centered or cell centered or anything. So in terms of some stencil and some integration volume, but it, it isn't tied. The implementation will be tied, but the derivation does not have to be tied. In terms of derivation, in terms of material model, it should work for any definition of your stress tensor. So whether it's linear elastic or large strain, small strain, elastoplasticity. Uh, and small strains, large strains in solid mechanics, these are kind of like compressible versus incompressible. These are the two uh, approaches. And then also the open foam version. Uh, I, I would ideally like this to work with at least the three main versions. At least not be really tied to some underlying uh, tens of thousands of lines of code that I don't want to force. Okay, so conservation of linear momentum. You have no advection term here because it's a Lagrangian approach. We're gonna move the material. Uh, so on LinkedIn a few weeks ago, I, I, I was looking for something to do ahead of Cambridge, but looked up, okay, Newton's from Cambridge. Uh, I found a bust of them online, tried out the, the new method on, on a wobbly version of Newton. Um, so anyway, this is just a generalization of Newton's second law. So conservation linear momentum, it's mass by acceleration on the left per unit volume, on the right, some of the surface and volume forces. So that's what we're enforcing. Okay, first what I'm going to do, and this is kind of similar to what they do in finite damage uh, when they derive nonlinear approaches. I'm gonna move everything to one side. I'm gonna define that as an F, as uh, like a function or a functional. So I'm defining this function equal zero. Uh, it's finite volume method, so we're gonna write it in integral form. It just is a little bit longer. I didn't want to do it until now. Uh, so what does Newton method say, or Newton Rapson method? Actually, Rapson, Rapson was also from Cambridge, but I couldn't find a bust of Rapson. And I think the actual Newton Rapson method is really Rapson's method. Uh, Newton's method was uh, not exactly the version we learned. It's the same from another, apparently. Wikipedia told me this yesterday. And so Newton's method for a system of equations, you can take an F like this, you can get uh, differentiate it with respect to what you're solving for, the unknown displacement, and multiply that by a correction, an unknown correction, and that will be equal to minus F times uh, the solution. So you can see I here represents the current value of D that you know, and then delta D will be the correction of that to push you towards the answer that would force F equal to zero. So you can derive that out by a Taylor expansion. So this thing here is normally called a Jacobian or a stiffness matrix. These are the coefficients for my matrix, basically. And this is put in a loop. So we solve for delta D, that's a correction to D. So let's imagine D zero to start. So then zero, you get these coefficients. Solve this linear matrix, get a correction delta D, and then you add that to your old D, and then update the iterator and just keep looping until it converges. If it's a linear system, if the Jacobian is not a function of D, uh, then it'll converge in one iteration and it'll be just consistent with the standard distillization. Just to mention here, I'm not going to go into details, but to get this to work with nonlinear, you use something called line search. So you don't add full delta D. They basically, it's like under relaxation. You under relax it, except that it's a smart way of under relaxing, which is basically what they do. Okay, so the Jacobian. I'm gonna go through a few minutes of equations, um, but it's okay, we have some nice pictures coming at the end. Okay, so I'm gonna take this DF and I wanna differentiate with respect to D. So I have a uh, divergence of stress term and I have a time term. I had a gravity term as well, but that's not a function of D, so I can just drop that out. So I've semi-discretized it. So the divergence term, finite volume, we're gonna sum the forces over the faces. That's the sum over uh, the areas by the F stress. Um, 
I'm going to uh, just to, uh, I can hear some groans. I'm going to switch to index notation. So I'm going to start, have to deal with third and fourth order tensors. And you have to do that in index notation. It's just a pain. And but um, just just stick with me. You don't need to, to know exactly the details. So I'm switching to index notation. So the first term, I want to differentiate the area vectors dotted with the stress tensor with respect to displacement. Um, but I don't want to do that directly because I want to have a general material approach. So I'm going to define something called G, and G is just the gradient of displacement. So G is just your gradient displacement. I'm going to differentiate with respect to the gradient displacement, and by the chain rule, then uh, get the derivative of the gradient displacement respect to displacement. So now I can separate the material response as the first term, and then the discretization of the gradient as the second term. And so then I could take the area vectors out here. So I said large strain, but this step here now, the area vector will be in general a function of the displacement for large strains. And so you would have to split that by chain rule again, but I'm gonna ignore that for now. You don't need to see that, but you, you will could add an extra term for large strains. So I'm gonna take the area vector out. I have a D sigma DG that is in finite element. That's essentially called this, the material tangent. It's a fourth order tensor, which defines the material behavior. So this is a material tangent, and these gradient coefficients are essentially defining your discretization. So how am I going to calculate that gradient? Well, I could do it a bunch of different ways. Uh, what I'm going to do here is for the uh, for each control volume face, whether it's cell-centered or vertex-centered, the wherever I'm integrating over, I'm going to define a gradient directly at the face using least squares. So whatever uh, points are uh, close to it in the stencil, I'm going to fit at least squares uh, plane through those. So if uh, I do that, I can write a least squares gradient as a sum over anything in the stencil, some least squares gradient uh, vector by the, uh, the displacement. Um, and then I can easily get the, the derivative. I can differentiate that with respect to D in index notation uh, to get a third order tensor, which defines my coefficient. Okay, it's not so convenient if it's third order, but it's not, it's, we don't really have to store these directly. Okay, so what does that mean? Let's go back to that uh, cell-centered approach, even though you can do this for vertex-centered. And take the face that's pink. I want to get the gradient of that face. So OpenFOAM has a, a few ways to do this. But what I'm gonna do is any um, cell which shares a, a point with that face, I'm gonna fit a least squares plane through, through all of those values. So you can see the highlighted pink ones. So the, I'm gonna get a gradient just based on that. So it's, it's a large tensor relative to maybe a standard OpenFOAM bar. <laughs> To cut a long story short, I tried this and there were some problems with oscillations and checkerboarding. Uh, so I also tried, which is a bit more open for me, is not the normal component, but the component from owner to neighbor, you could, you could take that uh, normal component and replace it. So the normal component is based on that and the rest is on least squares. But you don't have to replace it. So this, this zeta factor here is a scalar. So if zeta is one, I fully replace it. If it's zero, I don't replace it at all. And 0 0.5 means I half replace it. So I'll, I'll show you the effect of that later. The time term then there is, you can use, there's a myriad of finite different schemes you can use. So in open foam, you have steady state, first order Euler, you have second order backward. Um, and also in this case, I implement a, a second order Numark beta, which is a, a common, it's, let's say it's the, def, the, it's the standard in finite element uh, software is to use Numark beta. There's also generalized alpha, which is a generalization of that, which has, uh, some other nice features. Implementation in OpenFOAM. What do I need? What are the ingredients I need to, to implement this as a vertex-centered approach? So I need a dual mesh. So I need to have my in initial mesh, but I also want to define the dual mesh. So the dual mesh is where you, the control volumes are uh, around each uh, vertex. So thankfully, um, so this would represent the dual mesh here. There's a few different types of dual meshes. This is a typical approach where you join the cell centers to the face centers. So they, in general, aren't convex. They tend to have sticky outy bits. Well, that's okay if your discretization doesn't mind. So there's actually, if you, if you try out the utility called poly dual mesh, uh, this is one uh, piece of code that hasn't changed between all the versions because nobody's worked on it a long time. So it's almost, almost identical in, in the uh, OpenCFD versus foundation versus one extent version. So the mesh dualizer, are probably, apart from this poly tuple change versus direct tuple change, which seem to be the same thing. And um, so that's fine. I could reuse that code. I then, it stores some maps. I need to know a dual face, if, which cell it's in. So it doesn't directly give me that. So I had to construct a few maps just to figure out where I am to map between the domains. 
This was a bit of a pain. LDU addressing, I played with that and tried to write my own. It's really a pain in the ass, or at least I'm not good at it. So I just constructed a very simple sparse matrix format based on 20 minutes of Googling Stack Exchange. So C++ sparse matrix, they say use a hash table with a fixed uh, list of length two on i and j and just hash everything to store your counter coefficients. It wor works fine. And um, so I did that so I can easily, like MATLAB, just insert a coefficient anywhere between any, anything. I don't have to a priori define the uh, stencils. Then I need a linear solver <laughs> to have my matrix. Uh, initially, I tried with Eigen, which is a header only C library. It works fine, runs a serial. And uh, then I subsequently implemented interface to, to Petsy, inspired by ESI has now an external solver. I didn't use their one, but I, I uh, used the same concepts. And then I have to define all my operators. So I have to define my, I was calling it VFEM, vertex finite volume method, uh, DDT terms and your gradients and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, mm, more nice pictures. Oh, the first ones are not so nice. So this is a, a simple test case in solid mechanics, a, a cantilever. You just have a bending beam. They like it because in finite element formulations, there are many of them, like different discretizations, and some of them tend to be very stiff in bending, which is a bad thing. They don't like that. That means you need a very fine mesh to get accurate results. So it's good to check on this. So you just fix the left, apply attraction on the right. In this case, there's an analytical solution, and you can actually apply that as boundary conditions to make sure that it actually consistently converges to the exact solution. So you get a bending beam, not so exciting. Okay, so I tried it without this zeta factor, without replacing the normal component. So just a full least squares fit, and I refine the mesh, it's closer to first order, and then it explodes. You get all sorts of checkerboarding and oscillations, and it blows up. So it's an unstable discretization. So then I set it to one, fully replace the component, and then I get second order convergence. Um, but it's not very accurate. I'll show you comparisons. It's, it's not very accurate. So it would be essentially, it shows a sort of a, it's too stiff, which is like a, a bad funny down the formulation. So then I started playing, well, what happens if I only replace part of it? So I only replace 10%. And then suddenly the accuracy increased by an order of magnitude. So I'm like, well, maybe only replace 1%. And then it was another order of accuracy, uh, order of magnitude. And then I kept going, e to the minus four, five, six. So basically, this term replacing the normal component, you just need that for, to stabilize the solution. It's like reach out. So the same thing I think will work with reach out. Just don't, you don't need all of reach out, just uh, uh, you only need a little bit to stop the check of boarding and then just calculate the gradient whatever way you want. So if I try four, five, six, they all give the same answer. It seems to hit a threshold then. Eventually, if you go small enough, it, uh, uh, the, uh, the oscillations appear in the solution goes crazy. Yeah. This, I haven't yet checked if this generalizes. This is just for this bending beam problem. I don't know if this generalizes yet. For comparison, uh, Lin Giam solid foam is the standard segregated self-centered solver. That's the red there. Then there's Uns Lin Giam and coupled Uns Lin. So uh, coupled Uns Lin Giam is the self-centered block coupled solver. And then the Uns Lin Giam is the same discretization, but segregated. So it's super slow for this test case. And the reason for the difference is just because it has to iterate and the iteration error isn't that small because it takes forever to run. So it's similar to the cell center in accuracy, the, the block coupled cell center. Okay, uh, 3D dynamic. Uh, this is a test case uh, uh, Jelko looked at uh, a few years ago. Uh, th this is a large strain test case, but I, I only looked at it for the small strain regime. I wanted to have a transient test case. So you apply attraction at time zero, and then uh, it bends back, and then it keeps oscillating. So it's selected, so I think the period is, is, is one second. That's the way it's designed, so it just keeps the stance. So it allows you to examine the effect of your uh, temporal discretization. So if I look at the tip deflection, um, first look at first order Euler, which is blue. So first order Euler starts dissipating energy straight from the start. You don't even reach the peak displacement, and it settles, stabilizes everything, goes to zero. It goes to the steady state response. If you go second order backward, and then it's much better, uh, but you can see uh, over the 10, 10 period that the oscillation drops off. It's diffusing energy. Now I have relatively large time steps. The dots are the time steps. So re reducing the time step, they'll all give the same answer, but Euler is super small time step. But numark beta, depending on the parameters you select, you can select them such that it dissipates zero energy numerically. It fully conserves energy. The disadvantage is that energy sometimes changes uh, the frequency of that. So you might get high frequency oscillations moving from low. 
a little too high. But you can see the peak value stays the same. And there's no ex extra expense, really. It's essentially negligible, the difference evaluating these different schemes. At the end of it, I, I started to make a bunch of uh, test cases, but I, I've only time to include uh, one more. So I just went on GrabCAD, downloaded something interesting looking that wasn't a mess that had holes in it, and I found this pedal. Um, so I had a pedal for one of my mountain bikes once that which sheared off, so I thought it was relevant. Uh, so I assume it's aluminum. I'm gonna imagine the foot is on the top, all these areas. Um, I'm going to fix the axle. I assume the displacement is small. I'm going to assume I'm about 80 kg. If you look at the area, that's about two megapascals of pressure. Right? Um, I've tried a bunch of different meshes, like snappy X mesh and CF mesh. And in this case, I use G mesh. Um, you can't see there, it's about a million tetrahedra. But once again, this is a vertex centered approach. So we don't care about the number of cells, it's the number of points. And tetrahedra, uh, the ratio of cells to points is, is quite high. So you tend to have a small number of points. It's about five, five to one. So it's less than 200,000 points in this case, or, or unknowns. So this is our primary mesh. And then at the start, it'll calculate the dual mesh. So that's what the dual mesh, this is actually what it's integrating over. That they're like polyhedra. Okay, so I don't have any nice transient uh, pictures, but this is the deflection. So it's fixed. So the outside tends to bend a little bit. Makes sense. So the, the displace is most at the outer tip. And if you look at the stresses, I don't know if you can see very well, but 20 megapascals, kind of in the sharp corner there, that's where you get the stress concentrations. So uh, like typical bog standard aluminum, I guess you're talking a few hundred megapascals as a strength. So, but the fatigue, I'm not sure what the fatigue limit is. So I guess over many cycles that could shear off. Just to mention this, these were done with Petsy as the back end. Uh, so I'm not a Petsy expert. Petsy is a linear solver, open source library. Um, so I tried uh, conjugate gradient and IL0. That would be like your standard in OpenFOAM, but it just diverges. So because the system, it's positive definite, but it's not uh, diagonally dominant. Um, and it's much more dense. So if you try ILU1, so uh, a little bit of fill in, it's, a, it's basically like a preconditioner uh, that does more work. Then you get convergence. If you try ILU2, it, it gets better convergence, but it's slower. So there's just some tra trade-off being a better preconditioner and more expensive. I tried GM res uh, too. Um, I didn't try optimize it. Um, it has a restart at 500. That's why it peaks up or whatever, but it was slower in this case. I also tried a uh, multi-grid, uh, but it was 10 times slower because I don't know how to set it up. It has 30 settings. Um, so I need to find someone who knows how to use Petsy. Okay, final thoughts. Uh, one of the motivations I didn't really, I didn't clearly give the motivations for why I'm doing this, but that's okay. And um, so one motivation to finish on is efficiency. The default segregated solvers for solid mechanics are slow. They, there's, there's many cases they're fine uh, when it's blocky geometry, but if you're very thin geometry, it can be uh, require, require a lot of iteration, outer iterations, like simple pimple inter iterations. And uh, so block coupled from the cell center to block coupled approach is definitely promising as those this vertex one. Maybe as well for robustness as well. One challenge, um, the dual mesh, sometimes finding the map, if you've kind of a, complicated unstructured mesh to begin with, then the dual mesh sometimes can be, they're bad cells and then finding a map is, is, is difficult uh, to do that. You don't wanna do it geometrically. Um, and then future direction. So doing all of that generality in terms of material, um, I showed for plasticity yesterday, it, it, it works uh, already, which is good, but then for large strain and geometric loading. Uh, one other idea I'm interested in this is do the higher order methods. Uh, I suspect there's some reasons I think it could be nice for vertex centered. And that is that. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Very nice presentation, as usual. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Uh, regarding the stencil for the least squares, you use the the immediate neighbors. Uh, have you tried largest stencils to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I haven't. Uh, but using, if you use this general uh, sparse matrix format, you can insert a coefficient between anything because it's not, it's just storing two indices. And then, and Petsy doesn't mind either when you insert it. Um, so you could do that. Ah, and that's the idea for if you go, you don't need a larger stencil here, I think, unless maybe some locally bad cell or something, but for a higher order, you need a, a larger 
if you're going to use least squares to fit a quadratic function or something, then you need more points. So um, that's an idea to play with, I suppose. Questions? Um, just a question, if you have any problems, um, does it run in parallel? Uh, yes, it, it did, though I think I was checking this week where, again after I added things, I think I broke something, but it, it, uh, PET-C uses global indexing for the matrix. So you just need to come up with an index that's unique for each vertex globally. So it's not too difficult to do that. You have three types of points. You have ones that are local to a processor, ones shared by two processors on a boundary, and ones shared by more than two so-called shared points or global points. So if you just come up some way to number those, then you can insert a coefficient in PETC from any processor. So I can say insert between 0.1 and 1 million on any core. And when you assemble the matrix, uh, PETC will, will do all the syncing for you. They say don't do that in general for most of them. Yeah, yeah. So I was worried about that because I don't want to look in Meshulizer, but uh, it works. And um, so the, the nice thing is if you're a point on a processor boundary, I just ignore the processor boundary because. Uh, I'm integrating over the, the dual faces that go up to the processor boundary because the, the contribution of one processor boundary and the other uh, cancel out exactly. So I can just ignore the processor boundaries and it, it imagines it's a cell that's shared across uh, or a control volume that's shared between two processors. Uh, I, I, I think yeah, you're looking uh, like uh, uh, you don't understand because I didn't explain it well. So I'll try my best after this over coffee to explain uh, how that works. Partly, I just did it and checked if it worked and, and crossed my fingers. Uh, but uh, yeah, an, an initial uh, test case is run in parallel, which is nice. Except when I go to a larger number of cells, like 1 million, I get a weird segmentation fault from Petsy, and something is not right somewhere in maybe indexing or something, or uh, I don't know. I need to find, I need to find out. Thank you. Questions? I noticed that in the computational molecule, there are more, more nodes involved compared to cell center. So do you think the molecule would be more, the stencil would be more, I mean, use more memory compared to the cell center? In general, vertex-centered versus cell-centered, you can define whatever stencil you want. So there's no fundamental reason vertex-centered is bigger. Um, in this case, I chose a stencil that I could similarly choose in cell-centered. Um, there was a few reasons for going in that I, I, I guess I don't need to go into details of doing that. There's a variety of ways to do it. I could even have used shape functions here, uh, finite element shape functions to define my gradients and I could integrate over those. That would work fine as well. Uh, the, the extra memory comes from block coupled. It's a block matrix. Uh, there's far more, far more uh, memory used than uh, segregated nodes, but typically faster. Questions? No, okay, thank you very much. Do we have questions from uh, online participants? You can uh, unmute your mic if you want. Do okay, you can. Uh, yeah, so one question if you can read is, for updated Lagrangian, would vertex center be more efficient? So updated Lagrangian is for a type of large chain approach where you move the mesh. If you use a cell center approach, you have to interpolate the displacement from the cell centers to the vertices, and you add error when you do that. So the nice thing about vertex centered is you have the displacements at the vertices, and then you can move the mesh. So yeah, yep, yeah, that will be more convenient uh, and maybe more efficient for updated Lagrangian. Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Philip.